I'm Jeff Glor from CBS Saturday Morning. Welcome to The Dish. We're firing up the grill in today's episode and visiting some of the best barbecue joints, famous for their smoked meats. We introduce you to a master of Carolina pulled pork, serving up his savory whole hog specialty. And a self-taught award-winning chef takes us along the culinary journey of a 16-hour smoked brisket. But first, we get a taste of the Lone Star State. A Texas barbecue pioneer opened his restaurant in the 1950s, and now his grandson is keeping the flame burning. Janet Chamlian visits Davila's for a bit of their barbecue grilled cheese and signature slow-cooked lamb. 41. I got you. I got you guys. In the city of Seguin. There you are. Davila's barbecue is destination dining. What in Dayuno? See? And it's destiny for Adrian Davila. This is where I'm in my, my element the most is fire, meat. He's a third generation pit master. Six decades after his grandfather started the restaurant in an old schoolhouse. Cooking in front, the family living in back. Whenever you're trying to live up to a, such a legend as my grandfather was in the community, as far as the barbecue space, like he was the grand master because he didn't leave the pits. Mm -hmm. Every stick of wood, every piece of meat, every sausage that was hung, it's him, his decision only. Nobody else touched the pits. So that barbecue always came out with his stamp on it. And my you hair. felt that responsibility? Absolutely, my hairs are standing up right now. You still do? I still do. Raul Davila was a butcher by trade. Indelible memories for Adrian. I remember him taking something that at the time was so primal as a big cut of meat and breaking it down and making something beautiful with it. And when it came out onto the table and people enjoyed it, that was astonishing to me. Adrian's dad, Edward, took over in the mid-90s, making his own mark. Thank you, sir. 46. But never asking his son to work in the family business. Did you have 46? Yeah. OK. Envisioning something better, even though it's all Adrian wanted. But when, again, I was able to see what it created and how you created memories with food, birthdays, celebrations, anniversaries, weddings, you create memories. And I just, that, that hooked me. All right, guys. So did his family's culinary history. This is your place? All right, yes, this is the ranch. This is where my wife Inspired by Vaqueros, Mexican cattle herders, Davila took us to his ranch. This is what we call a, a barbacoa en pozo. For a look at how they slow cooked meat, like this lamb, right. in an underground pit. Let's see if the magic happened. You know how they have like the oh pool. Oh my goodness. A tradition he's keeping alive today. Look at that. Is that ready to eat? When it's falling apart like that, there's nothing but. Mm. <laughs> you see the mm -hmm. seeds of the tomato, the onion, and the jalapeno. Yeah. The carols would celebrate like this, Davila says. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. An outdoor oh, feast a at a colorful table. It takes a lot of love and passion to create all this, and that's what makes it so satisfying. I'm going to get some. Oh, okay. Listen. Influenced by the past, but with an eye to the future, Adrian now runs Davila's. That means new items like the barbecue grilled cheese sandwich, chopped brisket, sauteed onions. Just a little butter on there, huh? Texas toast and lots of cheese. Get every little bit in there. You have to try this. Okay. This is now one of the best selling on the menu. Mmm. That's unbelievable. We sell more of these per day than we do our regular barbecue sandwiches. Really? Imagine that. As if we needed more, Davila prepared for us just about everything he sells. Their signature sausage, still hand-tied every day. This is exactly the way my grandfather made it, not changing the recipe. We Ribs are a barbecue staple and almost always pork. But here, they're lamb. Go ahead and have a short bite. Okay. And then the vinegar of the pickle mm -hmm. is what you got to follow up with. Chaser. Dip it right in the sauce. Dessert is big red cake. I have a big red cake. Did you do this to go? <laughs> yes, one of our biggest sellers right there. Really? Oh, yeah. Made with soda of the same name, a tribute to his grandparents. So as big red as oh my, my siblings and I would go to grandma and grandpa's house, 
Who's that big red cake in the fridge? It's our favorite thing. For Adrian Davila, it's always been about family. From his wife Sarah, his inspiration and teammate, to the men who held the title, Davila's pitmaster, before him. I was watching your dad yeah. watch you, mm -hmm. and you couldn't see it, but I saw the pride in his eyes. He's so proud of you. That's what we all want, right? We're born with this inherent trait to satisfy our parents. Mm -hmm. It's human. Everybody wants to satisfy their parents, right? Everybody wants to make their parents proud. The steward of a proud family legacy. Davalos, one of a kind. Up next, chowing down at the destination for whole hog barbecue. This is The Dish. When it comes to barbecue, salt, acid, and smoke are a recipe for success. That's proved true for Chef Rodney Scott, a James Beard Award winner and Barbecue Hall of Fame inductee. His talent for whole hog barbecue has taken him from his family's tiny store to one of the culinary world's highest honors. Jamie Wax traveled to South Carolina for a taste. It's early, very early in the morning here in Charleston, South Carolina. And the smell of wood smoke perfumes the air. Rodney Scott is busy supervising the hive of imposing grills at what has become a major destination for the culinary art that has made him internationally famous, whole hog barbecue. I wish the people watching this at home could smell this place. It's <laughs> unbelievable. Thank you. It'd be smell-o-vision. <laughs> Rodney Scott has been cooking whole hog barbecue since he was just 11 years old. Yeah at his family's variety store in the small South Carolina town of Hemingway. From that time till now, obviously, you've grown as a chef and a restaurateur, but has the process changed at all? I am definitely doing everything the exact same way that I did it when I was 11. It's just different equipment. So I still burn the wood down, yep. still take the hot coals and put it under the hog, and I still season the hog pretty much the same way. I mean, it's an obvious thing, but but when I read your description yeah. of what whole hog really means as far as flavor, it makes a huge difference because you've got parts of, of the hog that are gamier, parts that are fattier, parts that are leaner, and you make something brand new when you mix them all together, right? Yeah, when you put them all together, you get different bites from different areas of the hog. You know, we describe our barbecue as a difference you can taste. And what we mean by a difference you can taste is you have ham, you have loin, you've got belly, you got some shoulder. And when all those areas are combined, it adds up to one bite that can only be described as perfection. All right, that's very hot. All right, I'll try and pick a good piece. Okay. I'm gonna join you there. Oh my God. Honestly, best pork I've ever tasted in my life. That's part of my technique to break it up so the seasonings can go all the way through it. And when you turn it over to pull it, you have everything in there, you see that? It is true, the salt, the acid, the smoke, it's yes. all perfect in that one bite. But that one bite was only the beginning. And he looked like he had his legs crossed. And he was I joined him for lunch, surrounded by an incredible enough. spread of some of his most popular dishes from his book, Rodney Scott's World of Barbecue. It's part cookbook, part autobiography. There are worse jobs than sitting out in the South Carolina breeze with the master of Carolina barbecue and this beautiful table. So all the dishes on the table are pretty much a, a layout of my life. From the pulled pork where it all started, grandma's cornbread, what I remember from being a kid, the ribs, which I've come to love along with the pulled pork, collard greens, which I was a little reluctant to eating, but I do eat them now, my mama's banana pudding, and the dishes that are just introduced to me as a barbecue pit master later on was brisket. Looking at this layout of his life, it's hard to forget that the road to pit master started at such a young age. What is 11-year-old Rodney Scott like? 11-year-old <laughs> Rodney Scott wanted to go to a basketball game. <laughs> the work had to be done before you went anywhere. This particular day, it was a hog had to be cooked and the challenge was laid out. You're gonna cook this hog before you go anywhere. And I made sure not to burn the hog and when they flipped it over, I was like, good. You could pull the bone out like it's supposed to. It was done all over. Woo! 
I was like, I think I can do this. Others agreed. In 2009, Scott captured the attention of a New York Times food writer who wrote an article that changed his life forever. People started to say hello, and strangers started to say hello. Are you that guy from the New York Times? And phone calls from different newspapers and magazines started to interact with us, and I thought it was huge. The acclaim led Scott to finally accept the offer of investor and restaurateur Nick Pahakis. He opened his own restaurant in Charleston, which led to another remarkable achievement. They come in and they tell you, you are nominated for the James Beard Award. What did that mean to you at that time? When we got nominated for the Beard Award, it was unbelievable. To walk up on that stage and look back out at all of these great chefs and these people in the food industry, to be recognized as, you know, best chef Southeast was one of the most humbling moments I've ever experienced. Scott's growing success, coupled with leaving the family business, worsened a long existing rift between him and his father. Something he writes about with startling frankness in his book, which was published shortly before his father's death. I wish I could have had a real conversation about why he was so opposed to the things that I was doing that he wanted to kick me out of the business, kick me out of the family too. In this book, you write an incredibly powerful section about the relationship with your father. How did that come about and, and what did it feel like to put that down in writing? This was years ago that me and my dad did not agree on a lot of things. And in doing that, having that conversation for the first time, to say, I'm gonna tell the world this is what I experienced, was one of the moments that the tension, the not sleeping well, just kinda went away because I felt like it's gone. The load is off my shoulders. Letting go for Scott has led to a sense of gratitude for each day. It's the philosophy he literally wears across his chest. Every day is a good day. I always say if you're not in the obituary section, you got a good day. You know, you got a chance to create the mood, the feeling that you want to have throughout that day. You have an opportunity simply because you survived. And beyond just surviving, Scott is also focused on what's next. What are you most excited about looking at the future of Rodney Scott? Trying to spread our barbecue all over the entire world, everywhere. That's my goal. Still ahead, West Coast style barbecue with Southern Roots. We're talking brisket with all the fixings. Self-taught pit master Matt Horn has earned top honors for his skills on the grill. He credits family traditions for teaching him to produce smoked brisket so sought after people have waited in line for hours to taste. Dana Jacobson joined him for a full spread outdoor barbecue in California. Again, uh, half pound of brisket. It's the barbecue that draws customers in droves. We just hit our brakes furiously when we smelled the goodness coming out of this place. Horn Barbecue in Oakland. This one right here. Since opening, it's been known for both its snaking lines. Gotcha. And mouth-watering meats and sides. I'm going pulled pork, I might get the pit beans, maybe some mac. Dubbed West Coast style barbecue, its roots are in Texas and the South. It's the best barbecue I've, I've had outside of Texas. Well, this is like our primary uh, cut of meat. This is what everybody lines up for. So this is the brisket. This is the brisket. For pitmaster Matt Horn, barbecue isn't just the finished product, it's a journey. The smoke will come and it'll go right over it. From prepping and seasoning the meat to stoking the fire that brings it to light. Barbecue is more than just throwing logs in there and that sort of thing. It's very careful fire management. You know, you have to maintain that temperature. We usually smoke our briskets for about 14 to 16 hours. <laughs> it's definitely a commitment. You know, it's a labor of love. An appreciation Horn learned along the way. I mean, in the beginning, I'm just like, okay, I wanted to hurry up and finish the cook. And you find yourself popping the lid and looking. You know, what I did was I started to realize that throughout the cooking journey, you want to trust the smoker to do what it was built to do. Be one with the fire be in the moment, be present, and that's what I've learned to do. This is the finished product right here. Patience is now a virtue for Horn, but not for me. Matt, I'm drooling. Can I please taste it? Absolutely. <laughs> there you go. Enjoy. 
It melts in your mouth. Oh my God. I'm gonna be very unladylike. I have to mm -hmm. taste this. What, jalapeno cheddar, right? Yep, jalapeno cheddar. I got a full spread to sample in a backyard barbecue, starting with homemade jalapeno cheddar sausage links. I used to always see my grandfather eating the hot links. He would take it right off the grill and he would grab a piece of white bread and he, and would, just do right it that way. he would just do it that way. That nod to family in everything, from the smoked chicken, pulled pork and ribs, to the pit beans, collard greens, and mac and cheese. Grandma, he says, gets credit for the dessert. You gotta have banana pudding. Oh, this is delicious. Like the barbecue he serves, Horn's journey in it can be traced to childhood, when his grandfather was the pit master. Whether it was a wedding, a funeral, a birthday, or just a family gathering, you know, you'd always smell the smoke, the fire would be lit, and there'd always be a barbecue. In his early 20s, cooking became Horn's escape from his day job. He soon realized it was even more. Well, not only did it give me purpose, but I felt fulfilled with what I was doing in my life, finally, for the first time in my life. Once I decided that I wanted to start cooking, you know, it was a clear choice that I wanted to do barbecue because that was the thing that brought us together as a family. To hone the craft of barbecue, Horn turned to where it all began. I would drive down from Los Angeles every weekend to my grandmother's backyard and I'd take a notepad and I'd grab a few cuts of meat and I would fire the, the pit up and I would take extremely extensive notes. Your grandfather's pit. Oh yeah, and that was the only place where I could really barbecue. After a few months in the backyard with family taste testers, Horn headed to a farmer's market to sell his barbecue. I had about a little under a couple hundred bucks and I bought as much meat as I can with that. And I just literally believed in like, hey, if I don't cut corners and I contribute love and commit myself to this, someone will connect with it. And we went through the farmer's market for a year and we struggled. I even began to question, am I doing the right thing? What changed your mind? I took a few days off and I, I didn't cook at all. And I found myself laying in bed, thinking about the smoke, the fire, all these beautiful elements that make barbecue what it is. And I'm just like, you know what? I have to continue to push forward with this. That feeling was validated when Horn launched his very first pop-up barbecue. I sat in my truck and I was really emotional. Why? Because I was grateful that they even came to even to enjoy the food. Yeah. And then the next pop-up we had, it was 50 people there. And then the next one, you know, over 100. But little did I know that it would turn into what it's turned into. It was one of the largest pop-ups in the country and hundreds of people. Waiting hours. I mean, well, I, I mean. I can't even. Yeah, and they would set up their lawn chairs. They would set up tents. People do that for sporting events. You've gotten that sports know, side right? to it, <laughs> right? right? <laughs> I know. And it was, it was a beautiful thing. And I always made it an effort to go out and shake everyone's hand and thank everybody for coming, no matter how long it took. When his restaurant became a reality in the same area where his pop-ups became legendary, Horn made sure to include reminders of his journey, including his smoker Lucille, there from the start. Her name, a tribute to the iconic B.B. King song. Depend on Lucille. I would find myself in all these different places, farms, uh, at breweries and parking lots, alleys, whatever, sitting there by the fire. I'd have Lucille by B.B. King playing every single time. There was always something about that song that always made me, uh, I don't know, it always connected me back to the purpose of why I do what I do with barbecue. He says it's his way of giving love, something he's getting back in return. This thought that I had to commit myself to cooking it's brought me to where I am here now, you know. And I wish both of my grandfathers was here to just see like, hey, you know what? That thing that brought our family together, the thing that we've all connected to, I've taken that and I'm sharing it with my community and we're getting the recognition for it and we're, we're grateful. For more stories like these and live coverage of breaking news 24 seven, stream us right here on CBS News. I'm Jeff Glore. We'll see you next time for another helping of The Dish.